Thank you. So by the way, to uh, Chris's point there, um, I definitely, Chris and I have talked about this. You know, it seems that the harder I work, the luckier I get. And uh, there is truth in that and everything that Chris just told you, that uh, luck is important. You take all you can get, but uh, you're, the, more, the harder you work and the more engaged you are. People always tell me, Jeff, you know, you're always, you've just been really, really lucky. And the truth is, I've been really, really engaged. The more you get out of your house, out of your office, meet new people, introduce yourself, go places and try things, the more luck you seem to run into. As a prime example would be, if you came to this event today and made no attempt to meet somebody that you do not know and talk to them, you might have just missed your next, your next pass at luck. Um, very quickly, my background, I've been doing startups uh, for my entire life. Our biggest one, I've, I've done seven of them in, in internet technology, entertainment, media. The one that I was part of that, that that was our most successful was Priceline.com. Priceline was a scratch startup like everything you guys are working on. Today it's got a market cap of about $45 billion. So uh, I've been through small, large, all the different stages of entrepreneurship in different industries. Um, I spend my time now supporting entrepreneurs around the world, working with a lot of entities from the White House and the State Department to a lot of foreign governments, etc. As a matter of fact, just a quick side note, I just did the uh, keynote speech at the G20 Young Entrepreneurs Alliance event in Moscow that was attended by entrepreneurs from 30 different countries. And I do have to tell you guys, the Canadian delegation rocked. They were pretty fantastic in Moscow. I did the city tour of Moscow with them, but you guys should be proud of what your team there. So I spent my whole life launching companies. And people ask me, Jeff, what are you doing today? I don't launch companies anymore. I launch entrepreneurs. And that's what I want to talk about. What is the, some of the key ingredients? And I'm going to go pretty fast because Chris and I want to do some Q&A. Um, but but I, I want to talk about what's the key ingredient in launching entrepreneurs and why that's important. And what is the difference between launching companies and launching entrepreneurs? Uh, because I made that transition relatively recently. In support of that, I made a decision, by the way, after, like I said, about seven startups, Priceline was the fifth one, so I'd been doing this a while already, um, that I wanted to give back. And, and I think, by the way, every one of you in this room uh, owes that same sort of debt to the field of entrepreneurship. Reach behind you as many times as you can in your life and grab somebody's hand and pull them forward as well. The best thing we can do as entrepreneurs is support each other and support our community. And I have been trying to do that, so I decided I would take some time off to mentor entrepreneurs. And it turned into, uh, I've been on the road pretty much for a year and a half now, literally to every continent, traveling all over the world, looking at entrepreneurial ecosystems and meeting entrepreneurs all over the planet. I recently was mentoring entrepreneurs across Africa, uh, down in South America. I just came up from Mexico, Guatemala. I was in Turkey before that. What's interesting is that there are so many, our similarities, the gap between our differences keeps shrinking. We as entrepreneurs around the world are getting more and more similar, and that's because we're better connected through technology and social media. So I've been studying what makes the best entrepreneurs tick and what's important, and what can we learn from entrepreneurs all over the world. And I want to tell you this story, because this is the one that really got to me. So I got asked, I think this, this was a White House mission, Jeff, would you go to Egypt to uh, mentor entrepreneurs? And this was a pivotal moment in, in my thought process that I want to share with you guys this story. I don't know if you can see on the left of that picture, I'm standing in front of the Great Pyramids in Giza, in Egypt there. Uh, so I go to Egypt. The mission from Washington is, uh, you know, go teach entrepreneurship to post-revolutionary Egyptians. All right? So I go there with this mission of teaching entrepreneurship. And I get there, and by the way, this is what it feels like figuratively before I left. I call just to make sure that they know I'm coming. The phone rings, ring, ring, and I get a recording. Hi, this is Egypt. We're fighting a revolution right now, and we can't come to the phone. Could you call us back later? So already I feel like, what am I doing? And the reason I put an entrepreneurship sale is because I felt like I had my cart, and I was going down the street, the dirt of Egypt, saying, entrepreneurship, get some right here. And I'm selling entrepreneurship. And here's the lesson that I learned because I thought that was our goal, right? We're, we're selling entrepreneurship. But the lesson that I learned is entrepreneurship is not the goal. 
It's the means. Because what happened when I went, and I'm only using Egypt as an example. It's true everywhere, and I'll explain that in a little bit. When I was there in Egypt and I was saying, who wants to be an entrepreneur? And by the way, I could walk down the street of Montreal and ask people. If I say, who wants to be an entrepreneur? Some limited number of people say yes. The rest of the people say, I don't even know entrepreneurship. That's not for me. Because it's the wrong question. When I went down the street and said, who wants to be arbitrarily just be an entrepreneur for the sake of being an entrepreneur? The people in Egypt did not by and by respond, say, me, all I think about is entrepreneurship. They didn't say that. Here's what happened instead. I felt like my mission was a failure. People, in fact, did not want to talk about entrepreneurship, and nobody was sitting there saying, I just want to be an entrepreneur. So I sort of gave up, and I, you know, put my vendor card away, and I said, well, I can't sell any entrepreneurship today. So I went up to some people, and I said, hey, look, forget that. And I said, tell me about your life. And a young Egyptian woman said, walk with me. So we went to Tahrir Square, right, where it's all going down, the revolution. And she points to a spot, and she says, right here. And I said, right here what? And she said, right here is where I held my brother while he bled to death the night of the revolution. And I just stood there silently. And then she said, oh, Mr. Hoffman, can I show you my startup? And I said, well, wait, time out. And I said, how do you go from that to this? And she said, Jeff, the whole reason we did that was for this. She said, we gave our lives in order to be in charge of our own future. We fought a revolution because we wanted to be able to design and control our future. And something struck me right then. Entrepreneurship was not the goal. Entrepreneurship was the shovel you used to dig a path to a greater future. When she told me that, I said, tell me about your future. Tell me your dreams. Tell me your goals. And we sat and we talked about her life what she wants for her future, what she wants for her country, for her family. What are her goals? I ask you all the same question. What is your mission in life? In fact, one of the things I always do is ask people, because I was at a funeral, and at the end of the funeral, I was listening to people talk about the deceased, and I thought, wow, what are they going to say at my funeral? Because if they say something like, oh, that guy drove a nice car, then my life was a waste. So I thought, what do I want people to say? And I realized in my case, I would like the measure of success to be the number of other people's lives that I made better. How many people's lives did you improve with your life? And I realized I want someone to say that at my funeral. So you know what? I better do something with my life that causes that to be the result in the end of it. And when I realized that, I realized that I never wanted to be an entrepreneur to be an entrepreneur. What I wanted to do was achieve things that mattered to me by picking up the shovel of entrepreneurship and digging, doing the work that I needed to do. So what I did with this Egyptian girl was we drew a path to the best life we could design for her, and then I said, you know what's the best way to get there? It turns out entrepreneurship is a method for controlling your own destiny. Entrepreneurs design their future. Entrepreneurs design the future of people around them while they're going at it as well. She wanted to do that. So that was the lesson for me, is that this is the tool that we use, but it's kind of hard to dig if you don't know what direction you're going. Where is this path headed? Where are you leading to? So I'm going to challenge all of you to do that. What do you want people to say about you at the end of your life? What do you want to have accomplished with your life? And then how can being an entrepreneur make the path to those goals even easier and more direct because I believe that it can. So here's the thing. When I meet entrepreneurs now, the first thing they do is hand me their PowerPoint, their business plan, their financials because that's what we've been trained to do. But I no longer ask. My first question is never, show me your projections. My first question is, tell me your dreams. I want to know what you are trying to accomplish with your life. What is it that matters to you? What do you dream about? What do you want to have people to say about you at the end? That tells me a lot more about who you are and how you will perform as an entrepreneur than your financial projections do. When people are driven by purpose, they far outperform people that are driven by money. When entrepreneurs tell me, I'm going to get rich doing this, and that's the first thought on their mind, I'm far less interested than entrepreneurs that say, I'm going to do something that matters with my life. Um, it bothers me that we, and I'm going to say this on, half of, on behalf of the whole investment community, which I'm sure is going to get some people angry at me, we're really good at analyzing spreadsheets and projections. We really, are, we really don't spend much time analyzing lives. What I wish more people would do was analyze people, analyze the investor. What we're trying to find out is, 
what difference is this human being going to make to the rest of the world if they become successful as an entrepreneur? Instead of just saying, will this business that you're working on right now today generate profits in the near term? I know we're trained to do that. And, and, and having a viable business that succeeds financially is important. What I'm saying is your odds of having a financially successful business are much greater when you as an entrepreneur are driven by some bigger purpose in your life. If all you're driven by is money, then one day you look up, you're business isn't going well, you don't see the money on the horizon, you don't see the exit, guess what happens? Your incentive goes down. I'm doing this for the money, I don't see the money. So you start to deflate. If you're doing this for a purpose that's bigger than money, you will work around that and you will keep driving whether the money is there or not, and the money will show up as a result of that. I am going to not go into this too much, but Chris and I were on a journey together uh, with a group of entrepreneurs on a ship that sailed around the world to many different countries with kind of a big social experiment. All I want to do is point out a couple of the examples. The guy in the red shirt there is named Pedro. He was sailing on the ship that Chris and I are on mentoring these entrepreneurs. But what was very interesting to me was his, his startup needs to make money. There's no doubt about it. But what Pedro was focused on was his, his startup was about water, clean uh, drinking water. He had read the statistic that uh, the number of people that die every day from dirty drinking water is more than all the wars and violence in, in history combined. More people die from bad drinking water than die from wars and violence. That's pretty significant. So this entrepreneur said, I want to do something about that in my lifetime. And, and just sort of cut to the bottom line here, in the first city... In, in an African country where his drinking solution was applied as an entrepreneur, the child and infant mortality rate went down 75%. So you know what would be pretty cool at your funeral? <laughs> if somebody said she reduced the child and infant mortality rate in certain parts of the world by 75%. I think that's a little more significant. My point is that he will be far more driven to build a successful, efficient, and even profitable company because something matters to him. This is another example of one of the entrepreneurs that traveled with us, and I'm just going to do these quickly. He read that in certain parts of like rural India and parts of the world, Women don't have stoves, and they go to these communal stoves to feed their family, and they wait in line, and they, you see most of them are carrying their children. Their average, I think, lifespan is 39 years because they spend all day inhaling thick black smoke, and their babies inhale it because it's the only way they can make food. So he said somebody's got to do something about that. So they invented a smokeless stove that costs like one-tenth of what these other stoves cost, so these women get their dignity back. First of all, they don't die from smoke inhalation and cancer, nor do their babies, and guess what? They're not covered in black soot all day, so everybody knows they're poor. It's an indignity, because everyone says, well, she's poor, look at her, she has to use the community stove. She's covered in black all day. They have a smokeless stove they can cook at home, restore their dignity, and save their lives. That's a motivated entrepreneur. The last one I'll tell you was an African entrepreneur that we worked with who, found out the, the millions of people in Africa that are deaf. And in Africa, if you can't hear, you're kicked out of society. They don't take deaf kids in school in parts of Africa because it's too difficult to teach them, and you can't get a job. So the World Health Organization said, we'll help, and they sent millions of hearing aids. A month later, all those hearing aids were in landfills. You know why? Hearing aids are great, but nobody in rural Africa has batteries. They can't afford them, and they're not distributed there. So you know what this group of entrepreneurs did? They built a solar-powered hearing aid that requires no batteries, costs like one-twelfth what the other one does, and millions of people in Africa can hear now and be part of society again. All I'm trying to tell you is, when you have a purpose that's bigger than I want to get rich, you will be an amazing entrepreneur, and guess what? You'll get rich anyway, because the world will reward you for creating value and for your passion. Sometimes people say, well, Jeff, my company can't, doesn't change the world. I'm not building a solar hearing aid. You know what? That's kind of weak. Your company may not change the world, but your life can. You can have a company. I know a guy that sells wine on the internet. He's not saving, feeding the hungry. Or, or, you know, clothing the poor by selling wine on the internet. But you know what he does with his profits? He takes 50% of the money that he makes. Here's an example of one of his projects. He was wondering one day, a woman on his staff was wondering, what happens to women that are homeless or have no insurance? Single mothers in inner cities, how do they get a mammogram? The answer is they don't. Right? He was watching one of their, she, they were watching a commercial. So you know what they do? They go into the inner city, they use their company's profits, they find homeless women or unemployed 
single mothers and they take them to a hospital and pay for the mammogram. That's what they do with their success. Their company doesn't save the world, but their lives do. Their mission does. So entrepreneurs with a bigger purpose outwork and outperform entrepreneurs that don't have that. I will say as well that everybody has a golden purpose in life. And I use that term, that's something that we use at my company, Color Jar. We were all designed to do something. The question is to find it. Devin and I were having a conversation in the back that a lot of her life, people were telling her what they thought she should do. I lived my whole life being told, what is wrong with you? You never do what you're supposed to do. Well, I don't know who wrote that rule book. What I was supposed to do was go to university, get a job at a big company, and work there my whole life. What I did was I kept starting something attacking a problem, solving it, and then attacking another one. And people said, Jeff, you're really unstable. Every couple years, you're working on something new. Well, if my big downfall was that people kept acquiring my companies, then I apologize for being such a defective human being. Um, but that was the case. So for years, I thought I was unstable because I said, why can I not just solve a problem and then go solve another one? Because you're not supposed to do that. For a lot of years, I didn't know what was wrong with me. One day I discovered there is a name for my disease. It's called entrepreneurship, and it's actually okay. You can actually survive from it. Um, it's figuring out what your purpose is in life and designing your life, your companies, and your success around whatever it is you really set out to achieve. Be focused on a higher purpose. Again, the real secret sauce, everything. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room to succeed. Early on, I would see people on stage or on TV, and I would say, she's smarter than me. He's better than me. He's faster than me. Then, later when I got the, I was blessed enough in my life to meet some of the world's most successful people. And I remember one meeting, walking out, and I'll tell you literally what I thought. I walked out and I said, are you kidding me? That dumbass did that? And I thought, if that guy can do that, then what excuse do I have? He wasn't the smartest person in the room. And I actually thought I might even be smarter than that person. The secret sauce is passion. They're not smarter than you. They outwork you. They're dedicated to something that matters. They believe in something. They're driven to get up every single day. And some passion for something in life drives them every day. Those are the people that are most successful, not the smartest person in the, in the room. It's a great, entrepreneurship is a great way to lead your life if you have something driving you. So I wanna stop now and bring Chris back out because I want, we, Chris and I wanted to make sure we had time to have a little discussion with you guys. We got some microphones in the audience. Um, thank you guys for having us today and please bring us some questions, thank you. Thank you. And I should just say right now, I don't know whether, Jeff, I love <coughs> you or hate you. Um, we spent about 10 days together on that cruise on a ship, and I never got a chance to talk to you because the line of students and entrepreneurs to just have time with you, that, which you so generously gave, was pretty amazing. But I heard, I, I listened into a lot of those conversations. I came off the ship and said, I gotta go do something completely different now, because I, I can't uh, not do something without passion. And, I, and so, Thank you for sure. really screwing up my life. I really appreciate it. <laughs> oh, wait, can I just tell a really quick story? From, from that, I, I gotta tell you guys, so we're on that ship with all these young entrepreneurs and students, and I am telling one of these kids, I said, what's your plan? And he said, well, my plan is to be, I, I, sorry, I just gotta tell this. He said, I'm gonna be a mechanical engineer. That's what I'm studying. And I said, why? He said, my mom's an engineer, my dad's an engineer, my brother's an engineer, and that's what we do. And I said, okay, I said, forget engineering for a minute. And I said, in a world with no gravity, what's your dream? And this kid said, oh man, I love cooking and traveling. And I said, so if you could do anything with no boundaries, what would you do? And he said, I would buy a food truck and I would travel from city to city, feeding people and talking to people and learning about the cities. So, and then I said, all right, well, enjoy your cubicle for the rest of your life. I'm not saying not to be an engineer. I'm saying, really, you're just, you're just, what is the reason you're following path A versus path B? And he couldn't come up with it because people told me to, he said. And I said, so you're really willing to spend your whole life never doing the thing that you dream about? I don't even get that. So he came back the next day, running down, and he said, Jeff, guess what? He said, I'm not going to do it. 
And I said, oh, shit, the parents are going to kill me. <laughs> he said, I'm going to call my parents, email my parents from the ship, and tell them I'm not going to be an engineer, that I want to buy a food truck and be, dri drive around the world meeting people and cooking. And I was like, okay. And he's looking at me like, dude, this was your idea. <laughs> and, and I just want to say, you got off the ship in, in uh, Morocco, and the parents were in Barcelona, so you were very <laughs> yeah. clever. So the next day, he comes running down the hallway after he sends the email in tears down the ship, and I thought, oh my God, I just ruined somebody's life, which is why I said that. And he came up and gave me a big hug, and I started to say, look, I'm sorry, I should have kept my big mouth shut. And he said, even though it was email, I just had the first real conversation I've ever had with my father. And not only did he not shoot me, which is what this kid thought, but he made the down payment on the food truck. Pretty cool story. Okay, great story, cool. Jeff's got a million of those stories because he's so generous. Let's get some questions and, and hear what you're thinking. Um, so Bill Gates, <coughs> Jeff Hoffman, did you come to that higher purpose because you'd been already so successful and you're wondering what people are going to say when you die? Or was that higher purpose always with you? You know, you've built a $45 billion company, you've, you've built seven startups, and now you're at the next stage where you're sort of thinking, I need to do something good with my life. Was that always part of you? Is that something you wish you'd known earlier in your own path that you could give back so much? Um, well, yes and no. I mean, you can't deny that, that, you know, if you have business success in your life, it's easier to give back, right? But I kind of think that's weak because when I didn't have a dime, I volunteered my time. So I never, the reason that I didn't sit in a cubicle as an engineer the rest of my life is because I felt like I wanted my life to mean something. I just wanted to feel like I was living with some sense of purpose and some sense of positive impact. So early on, I never set out to be an entrepreneur because I wanted to make money. I set out to be an entrepreneur because I wanted to control my own destiny and be able to make, to take time if I wanted to take a day to help in some way. So. The, the sense of having a life that somehow matters in some way was with me from the beginning. Money was never a driver for me. In fact, money brought a lot of evil the first time I sold a company that I never anticipated. So I, I was sort of focused on that from the beginning. I, and yes, of course, there's things you wish you learned in your earlier life, and it is easier as you go. Uh, but I, I came to entrepreneurship to try to achieve something. And let me just add to this. If, if you're building a company now, you know that this is hard work. It's all encompassing. It, it takes all your time, all your <coughs> energy, probably all your money, and all of somebody else's money, too. Why not do something that matters? Right? Why spend your time in pursuit of, of a silly app that, that may or may not have any value in the world? Or, or when you have the opportunity, use that same time and energy and passion to go do something that you care about and it actually can make a dent in the universe. And again, if your product itself doesn't make the world a better place, that's fine. It's okay to run a good business, but make sure that your success does, that your life con contributes. Absolutely. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Sharon. I'm, I, I, I gotta say, first of all, your speech is very uplifting, but I, I'm, really, I'm really curious uh, when you discuss with your colleague investors do they share <coughs> that point of view? Because I, I'm, I'm afraid, you know, I'm actually building my company with the hope of being one day a philanthropist and an activist and all that. But my fear is that if I put it on my business plan, on my demo, the, inv the investor, the angel, the venture capitalist will automatically say that, I have no, that I'm not focused, that I'm not uh, targeting the business, that I'm targeting the right priority. Do, do you not okay. find that it's an experience? So uh, l let me say two things to that. None of that was ever in my business plan or my PowerPoint. It was in my conversations, though. But Chris made a really important point. When it's time to work, you have to work, right? One time in an interview, a reporter, after I sold one of my companies, said, what's the secret to success? And I remember being offended by the word secret. And I said, secret? The secret is, while everybody else was trying to find the secret, my ass was at work. Okay, there was no secret. Uh, when it is time to work, you have to put your blinders on and you have to perform. You have to earn the right to do the other things that you want to do. So I was always focused on getting the job done. But when we were successful, when we achieved things, we would set milestones. And we would say, when we hit this milestone, let's stop and do something fun. We would do a community project. At the end of each project, I'd take a little bit of the money the company made and go and do it. So 
you are correct. Your focus should be on building something successful and staying focused on the business. But it is okay in conversation to tell investors, look, I don't sit all day and think about money. I'm doing this because I want to make a contribution to the world. And believe me, when an investor hears that you're driven by a purpose other than the next dollar, they know that they can count on you when times are tough. And what I would, would add to that is that what I heard in your question was a little bit about like the guy who would say, you know, please God, if I win the lottery, I'll give some of it to charity. <laughs> right? Start doing the good work that you want to do now <coughs> because that will inform and really drive the business that you want to build. The I'm going to build my company and I'll get rich and then I'll be a philanthropist is, I would say, putting that out of order. Go, go do your good works, the things that, that drive your heart and give you energy, because that will help you drive your business. Which is exactly how those projects got woven into our business, because when we had no money and we're a startup, we were still doing things in our community. I completely agree. There's a question way in the back, and I don't know if we there's... Actually, we actually have time. And, and we, okay. can't, we can't hear Startup that question. Hockey. Once more with the mic on. <laughs> we only have time for one more question, so we're, we, we're going to pass it right here. Hi, Phil Nolting here with Qualify. Um, I had the opportunity last year to head to the Drucker Forum in Vienna, and the main topic of conversation there was uh, that pure capitalism was dead. Um, it's a pretty bold conversation, but uh, a lot of topics like B Corps and the, the idea of triple bottom lines came up. Uh, could you comment on that? I mean, for those who don't know, B Corps are anything uh, that has either two or three bottom lines. It's not all about financial, it's either social or environmental as well. Um, there's a huge rise of this whole uh, wave towards actually having social good and social entrepreneurship and social grants. Uh, Europe just launched a $6.8 billion social grant. Um, do you really think that's the future of it and is capitalism really dead? I, I'm not going to tackle whether capitalism is dead. What I will say is that I, I, I find it really almost offensive that we put this category of social entrepreneurs somehow separate from any other entrepreneur as if it's different. Right? I think that these are, these are entrepreneurs who you know, don't need a little <coughs> pat on the back for doing good work. They're entrepreneurs who are actually going out and building businesses. And, and by bifurcating them into they're the entrepreneurs who are going to do you know, job creators, and then there are those really nice guys who are doing that social stuff. It's, uh, aren't they sweet? I, I think we do a disservice to both. So uh, I have a problem with that bifurcation, uh, generally. Uh, so uh, I'll close by saying, first of all, I completely agree. The fact that you can be an entrepreneur or a social entrepreneur, like there's a category is absurd to me. I don't know who created that. People that wanted to sell more books, I guess. But uh, yeah, I, so I agree with that. But let me just close with this quick story about, quote, capitalism. So I was 20-something years old. I sold my first company to a big Fortune 500 company, never thought about money, and suddenly one day I sold a company for millions of dollars, and I was 20-something years old. Never planned for money, never thought about it. Guess what happened? Everybody hated me. Nobody said congrats. People started treating me bad. I didn't know who to trust. It was actually not a fun experience. One day I was really depressed. I was like thinking about that song, Mo Money, Mo Problems. And I was like, well, crap, it's true. Um, I was sitting there and a TV show came on, a news story about a, home, women, a, a shelter for abused women. All the women on TV were crying because they hadn't paid their mortgage in four months and they were all being sent back to the streets or to the men who abused them. So sitting in that chair one day, I thought, oh my God, well, here's what I first thought. Oh boy, I hope somebody does something. And then I thought to myself, if everybody watching this news report says, I hope they do something, uh, who does something? Nobody, because we're all hoping they do something. So I went back to my office and I wrote on the wall in giant letters, there is no they. It's us. If you want to make a better world, do it yourself. So guess what I realized? They can hate me because I made money, but you know what I did? I took a bag of that money and I paid the entire next year's worth of expenses for an abused women's shelter. Do I hate capitalism? Not anymore. You know why? Because it occurred to me that I couldn't wait. I didn't feel bad ever again about making money. What I thought was, if I can work really hard, make money and solve problems that other people can't solve because they don't have money, then I will be back at work with a shovel in hand tomorrow morning. Making money is not a bad thing. Failing to use it for good is. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I left the picture.